The old adage, if you're not thinking about it, you won't diagnose it, certainly applies in endocarditis. You'll never diagnose a patient with endocarditis if you're not thinking about endocarditis, because it can sometimes be a difficult diagnosis. Indeed, endocarditis can present simply as a fever of unknown origin. Thus, one of the goals of this talk is simply to get you thinking about endocarditis by becoming familiar with its risk factors and clinical manifestations. Please note, this talk will focus on infective endocarditis, or IE, that is, endocarditis caused by a microorganism. Please distinguish IE from endocarditis related to other causes, such as Lubman Sachs endocarditis, which is associated with lupus. This talk has a few different learning objectives. First, you will learn about risk factors for the development of infective endocarditis. Second, you will learn to appreciate common clinical presentations of patients who are affected with endocarditis. It will be important to recognize the different types of pathogens that most commonly cause infective endocarditis. And finally, we will review diagnostic criteria for IE, specifically the Duke criteria. Also provided is an outline of what this talk will cover. First, there is a case and a question that will follow. The factors that put patients at risk for infective endocarditis will be reviewed. Common clinical manifestations, as well as commonly implicated pathogens, will be discussed, as will Duke's criteria for diagnosis. A case. A 56-year-old male with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis presents to the emergency department with two days of fevers and shaking chills at home. Vital signs are temperature 38.8, heart rate 116, respiratory rate 24, and blood pressure 110 over 70. Physical exam reveals an anxious appearing male with dry mucous membranes, two out of six holosystolic murmur at the apex, rawls, and small subungal hemorrhages. Blood cultures are drawn and the patient is started on IV antibiotics. Which organism will most likely grow from the patient's cultures? A. Viridin streptococcus, B. Enterococcus, C. Strep bovis, D. Staph aureus, E. Iconella. The answer is D. Staph aureus. Staph and strep account for the vast majority of cases of endocarditis, but acute endocarditis is more likely to be caused by Staph aureus. This patient's fulminant presentation is more consistent with acute endocarditis. Viridin strep, enterococcus, strep bovis, and iconella are all causes of subacute endocarditis. Iconella is one of the HASIC organisms, sometimes referred to as culture negative, although it is important to note that the HASIC do grow in culture. They just require special nutrients. They will be reviewed further when we discuss common pathogens of endocarditis. Now we will move on to risk factors for the development of infective endocarditis. There are many different risk factors for endocarditis. Having a non-native or damaged valve puts a patient at a substantial risk. Therefore, patients with valvular disease, congenital or rheumatic heart disease, and those with prosthetic valves are considered to be at risk. Those who are more likely to become bacteremic are also at risk, including IV drug users and those on dialysis or who have indwelling hardware. The other category includes pregnant women or patients who have shunts for management of ascites or hydrocephalus. HIV may also be an independent risk factor. Next, clinical manifestations. When a patient presents with endocarditis, there are often nonspecific complaints, but exam findings may be more characteristic for infective endocarditis. Symptoms may be worrisome, as in the case of acute infective endocarditis above, in which the patient was septic with abnormal vital signs. However, patients may also present with subacute infective endocarditis, complaining of weeks of malaise, fever, anorexia, sweats, myalgias, arthralgias, headache, or cough. When examining the patient, special attention should be given to the skin, digits, conjunctiva, fundi, and obviously the heart. A careful neurologic exam should be performed as well, as patients may present with a focal deficit since infective endocarditis puts patients at risk for stroke. 
General confusion and changes in mental status can also be seen. Other signs of infective endocarditis include murmur, rawls, splenomegaly, and skin lesions. When thinking about the skin and extremities, remember that Osler's nodes are tender, tall lesions on the toes and fingers, whereas Janeway lesions are painless and found on the palms and soles. Splinter hemorrhages are small linear lesions under the patient's nail beds. Roth spots are retinal hemorrhages. Lab abnormalities. Patients with infective endocarditis may often show a leukocytosis with increased proportion of neutrophils. They also will commonly demonstrate elevated ESR and CRP levels, as well as anemia. Many patients will have hematuria and proteinuria, but you should also look for red cell casts, an indication that the patient has glomerulonephritis, one of the immunologic phenomena associated with endocarditis. Common pathogens. In one study, the International Collaboration on Endocarditis Investigators enrolled 1,779 patients with definite IE during a 48-month study period. Of these patients, 558, or roughly 32%, were found to be infected with Staph aureus. Other common pathogens included viridin strep, enterococcus, and coagulase-negative staphylococcus. Streptococcus bovis is also important because it is associated with GI malignancy. The HASIC organisms include Haemophilus, Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinella, and Kingella. They were traditionally referred to as culture negative, although they will actually grow in culture, but only with specific nutritional requirements. Diagnosis, including Duke's criteria. There are several sets of diagnostic criteria, but you should be familiar with Duke's criteria. Diagnosis comes from the patient meeting two major, or one major and three minor, or five minor criteria. Major criteria can be thought of in terms of microbial and valvular. The microbial criteria include 1. Two separate blood cultures positive for typical microorganisms, including viridin streptococci, streptococcus bovis, HASIC organisms, staph aureus, or enterococci. 2. Persistently positive blood cultures with an organism consistent with infective endocarditis. Blood cultures must be drawn more than 12 hours apart. 3. Positive blood cultures from 3 of 3 or 3 of 4 bottles. 4. Positive blood culture for Coxiella burnetii or anaphase 1 IgG antibody titer greater than 1 to 800. The valvular or endocardial criteria include 1. Positive echocardiogram for infective endocarditis with an oscillating mass. 2. Abscess. 3. New partial dehiscence of prosthetic valve or new valvular regurgitation. Minor criteria include the following. 1. Predisposition, such as a predisposing heart condition or intravenous drug use. 2. Fever, greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius. 3. One of the vascular phenomena, such as major arterial emboli, septic pulmonary infarcts, mycotic aneurysm, intracranial hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhages, or Janeway lesions. 4. One of the immunologic phenomena, such as glomerulonephritis, Osler's nodes, Roth spots, or rheumatoid factor. 5. Microbiologic evidence that does not meet major criteria. Or 6. Echo that is abnormal but not diagnostic. Summary. Infective endocarditis affects at-risk patients, including those who have pre-existing heart disease, are immunosuppressed, on dialysis, or abuse IV drugs. Common pathogens are staph and strep and differ based on time course and underlying risk factors. Duke's criteria for diagnosis include two major, one major and three minor, or five minor criteria. References